Yeah, and thank you everybody for sticking around. <laughs> I hope we'll have some fun. We have some uh, interactive de demos. Um, before I start, does anybody have their own data they would like to try this application with? Okay, so there's, uh, there's a demo page that you can access if you follow some of those links there and you can get some uh, uh, data files to work with or just follow what I'm doing. So this is a workshop on supervised learning of behavioral modes from acceleration data. What we're gonna have is a pointer work. Yeah, so <laughs> a short introduction. Uh, I'll talk a bit about the acceleration signal, it's what we have to work with, a bit about the learning part of supervised learning, and the web application, which would be the main part. Okay, so in this conference, many people have talked about um, getting behavioral modes from acceleration data. Uh, there, there was a, an entire session. This is a field with growing popularity in ecology, yeah, movement ecology. Uh, it was introduced in 1999 by Yoda, and according to a recent uh, review, was applied to over 120 species, 120 different species. Here is just uh, one example. This was uh, Ohl's paper. Is all. <laughs> uh, in, in, this, uh, in this paper, they uh, followed vultures and uh, measured feeding events uh, in the vicinity of uh, feeding sites. Hi, all. <laughs> uh, uh, this was done using the ACC accelerometer tracers. And uh, as a result, it was, they were, uh, all was able to plot a graph of uh, traveling distance as a function of days since feeding, and you get this nice uh, unimodal fit. This is just one example of many. Uh, I don't have shy slides because they didn't fit in my presentation. <laughs> Um, one way of thinking about this is that the behavioral annotation is uh, a, a layer over your data, very much in the same way as you might think of uh, environment, environmental data or any other informative layer. So <laughs> here I'm showing uh, a migrating stock, uh, the trajectory of a migrating stock in black and white or in color, where these colors uh, annotate the behavior. And what you can see is, uh, well, the green and yellow, the green and the yellow are flight, the rest are local behaviors. And you can see the, the daily flights and stops and so on. And now the rest of this is gonna be all about acceleration data. So take a minute to talk about the actual signal that we get. Um, <laughs> this is a, a nice drawing of a, a conceptual accelerometer uh, that I took from uh, Sivan Toledo, who is uh, Ran Natan's partner in the Atlas uh, program that you probably remember from the speech. And the way this works is we have a weight tied on both sides uh, to uh, springs. And during a constant... Uh, constant uh, velocity movement, this thing is, uh, the weight stays in the same position, obviously. But when uh, an ac acceleration or when a force is applied to this uh, construct, the, the weight will move, uh, pulling one of the springs and with a, disp a displacement proportional to the force. And this will uh, let you read out the acceler ac acceleration this body is uh, field. Now, um, I wanted to bring, I wanted to bring uh, one of the loggers and do a demonstration, but that's not possible because it's uh, restricted radio equipment, so can't really go through borders with it. Luckily, we all have these on our, our telephones and, uh, well, iPads, so that's what I'm going to do. OK. 
Okay. Okay. So now I'm streaming the. Can you all see it there? I'm streaming the three dimensional three dimensional acceleration signal from my tablet there and should have done it there. Um, well, what we can see is what we can see is that I intended this to be flat, but it's not, so we don't see the right thing. So okay. <laughs> okay. So the color codes, the x, y, and z uh, axis, and this. Uh, what we have is more or less a 1G for 1G acceleration, uh, 1G force on the Z axis, and the rest is zero. It's because the tablet is lying flat on the floor. But now I'm going to ask Shai to walk around with it. <laughs> you can see what happens. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> that's what we get from our stock. <laughs> And this is the sort of, uh, these are the sort of traces that we work with. So, turn this off. Because uh, just like the biologgers, it will finish my tablet battery. So. Okay. Continue. This is not connected. <laughs> okay, so to talk a bit about the learning part, the, the application is designed to do some sort of learning of uh, behaviors from these acceleration traces. So what do we mean? When we talk about the learning, which is a term that comes from uh, machine learning and computer science, um, there's a, a wide division into supervised and unsupervised learning. So in the previous talk, uh, a, a, an unsupervised learning uh, algorithm was described. This one is supervised. And what this means is that we need uh, to learn from examples. In this case, uh, we need labeled data. What this means is you have a trace, or shy, <laughs> uh, looks at a star. The star is flying. So Shai writes down, okay, fly. And then you take the acceleration trace and you, you have a file with acceleration, flying, acceleration, walking, acceleration, something else. Yes, so this sort of data. Um, whereas in unsupervised learning, you do not have this. All you have is data and your task is to make sense of a bunch of data with no labels. So the type of analysis you wanted, you'll want to do probably depends on the question do you have labeled data? Or do you want to, or are you able to acquire labeled data? And this, this workshop, as I said, deals with the supervised case. Um, now I'm going to invite Shai to say a few words about how we actually acquired these uh, labeled data. Shai. <laughs> oh, you want to? You need, okay. in, order, in order for this to work, you need the acceleration on one hand. Yeah, one second, I just, uh, the Stay with this and I will talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's only three sentences, so. In order, in order for this to work, we need the acceleration on one side and the behavior on the other side. So uh, we basically need to go out to the field and watch, oh, or maybe not in the field, maybe in, a, in an ivory, and watch our animals and see how they, and, and get, this, uh, get this data of matching of acceleration and behavior. And I have maybe three or four very simple lessons that, that we've got after collecting this data. So the first one is, it's not always so trivial. Be sure that you are really looking on the animal that you are, think that you are looking. <laughs> if you are not 100% sure, then just omit the data, otherwise you will, uh, you will really insert, insert a strong noise to the data that it 
later on. It's, it's the, dic the dictionary that will help you to translate all the other stuff. And uh, the second one is to be as uh, diverse as possible in collecting the data. If you have one animal which is a bit tamed and it's more easy to look about, to, to, to observe, uh, you, you need at some point to leave it and to go to other animals because the patterns are a little bit different between the animals because of the different, slightly different behavior of the animals and even the slightly different uh, positions of the transmitters on the animals. So if you got like 50 standing observation of one individual, there's no much point on collecting more of those. You need to get uh, different behaviors from, from this individual or the same behavior from other individuals. So you should be diverse with the individuals, with the habitat, and with the behaviors. And uh, the, two, the two, two more is try to do some pre preliminary sessions and be really accurate with your, uh, uh, define what observation you expect to see and then be accurate with your term terminology because later on you like to be very consistent even over many seasons. And the last one is if you see, ob if you see behavior that you think mm, there is a little chance that later on I would be able to classify them from the acceleration because the different behaviors are, are, a, bit, are a bit small. Like at least in our example, we have a certain uh, behavior of swallowing that the stork is doing, but really the, the, the patterns that you would expect that the body changes between successful pecking and which uh, is, is later followed by swallowing and the regular pecking, the differences are quite small. So, but even if you think that the differences in the acceleration that the, that the animal would feel, that the transmitter on the animal would feel are small, you should still try to get it into two different behavioral categories because later on you run the model, you see that yes, the acceleration signal for these two behaviors is too weak to classify and then you can join them. But later on you cannot do the opposite. Uh, what to do? So that's all. Yes, we also do videotaping of the behavior. Uh, the big, the big disadvantage of this that, that it's it's actually doubling the time of, of the work because the same amount of time you spend in the field you will later <laughs> spend in watching the video. But we also do it. It's essential in some transmitters when you don't have all the time really the the exact uh, the possibility to exactly match the acceleration to the behavior and then you rec you record and you know it from the time in the video but with eobs transmitters they really especially for this work of matching the acceleration and the behavior they added a specific uh, radio signal that give you a sign it sounds like it means beep, beep, beep. and then you know a measurement of acceleration had started and the sign when the, the uh, measurement of the acceleration ended, and then you know exactly what you're watching. One advantage of video taping is that you know that you did all the work. You still have one to two opportunities of escape in the case of transmission, or training, perhaps, to do relatively fast acceleration. That's it. Thank you. So back to learning, uh, I said we're learning from examples, so let's have an example here of learning from examples. So that's us flapping. Uh, here's a trace, very similar to when Shai was flapping earlier, uh, of a bird uh, flapping. Um, well, it, the, Z, the variation in the z-axis is very distinct, so you would all say this is flapping without knowing. Um, and here's one more and two more of walking. Now, if we ask intuitively how can we tell these apart, you'd probably say, well, all you have to do is look at the red line and you'll know. How will you know? Well, you might look at the standard deviation or maybe the mean of the red line. Kind of ignore all the rest and you'll be fine. So, but how will you do this on a um, on, on, on the computer. So I'm going to show one method called a support vector machine. 
So here I'm plotting some examples of the flapping, some of the walking, where my axis are the mean and the standard deviation of the z axis. But okay, so this, this is your data. Then you have a few new examples. You do not know if these are flapping or walking, and the question now is, what will you assign to these new points? And this, the very simple idea behind the support vector machine is, let's just draw a line that separates our two categories. We will not just choose any line, because you can draw any number of lines to separate them. Right? You can have a line that goes here, here. I would like the line that maximizes the distance to the closest point. The, the idea behind this is that similar points, or close points, probably have the same category. So I would like points close to this to be on the right side of the line. Um, OK, so then what we have is everything on this side of the line I'll then classify as flapping, and everything on this side of the line I'll classify as walking. This is easily extendable to uh, many variables. This is a very common, uh, this is a very common tool, it turns out. Okay. Um, unlike this toy example, though, uh, in, in a real problem, you'll need to follow a large number of steps, starting with choosing the method or the model for classifier, choosing the statistics, because the z-mean and standard deviation are not likely to work on a generic case. Uh, you'll probably have some pre-processing steps, like you always do. You'll need to fit the model, run cross-validation, and then you can use it on your new da data. And Yes, <laughs> this is a lot of work, and this is what our application is trying to help with. So it will do all of these steps for you, except for choosing the model, evaluating the model, you'll have to do yourself. Okay. Um, software and biology has sort of a long history in uh, making methods available to communities and driving, driving fields forward, actually. And here are some examples. This is gene pop from uh, population genetics. And in parentheses, I have the number of citations for this uh, package as of a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> Probably went up. Uh, GeneLex for genetic analysis in Excel. And uh, MaxEnt, probably most people know. Um, these, these packages have a huge amount of citations. But maybe more importantly, they they make the sort of analysis available and uh, easy in a way that uh, wouldn't be possible with otherwise. Uh, okay, so this, uh, uh, this leads to our web application. Uh, this is a simple but flexible tool, simple as in you can just start using it. You don't need to know almost anything. Uh, I mean, about uh, machine learning or the type of model you want to use, it will show you what we need to know. Um, for rapidly training, evaluating, and using models for supervised learning of behavioral modes from ACC data. And I will now show you an example of using this. Uh, before I do, there's uh, a couple of uh, uh, extra sources of uh, information. There's a manual that I'm going to show right now. So I put it up here. There's a uh, manual. It's uh, easily accessible from the main page of the application. Just like this. So you just click on manual and it will open in a new page like this. Um, the manual has uh, a detailed description of almost everything I'm going to uh, go through now. And well, the other thing is that we're going to have a software paper describing the system, which you can please cite if you use it. And okay, so now I'll go to the application. This is the main. Uh, it's on that side now. The the main uh, page of the application, and the first thing you might want to do is use upload to upload your labeled data to the application. And I'm going to do this on the slides and then f fast on the application just because it would be easier to see here. So the first thing you need to do 
is choose your data, your data file. And choose file. And you have to specify how your data is arranged. Now, as we were saying before, you have uh, rows of your ACC data, and then you have, you'll have a column, show that here, you'll have rows of your ACC data and a column of your labeled behavior. Uh, now, since most of us use three-dimensional acceleration, uh, you might uh, order it as all of your X's, all of your Y's, all, all of your Z's, or probably more commonly X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. Um, in either case, you can specify that here, so X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, or X, 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 Y, or Y, Z, Z, Z. Um, you might want to feed uh, pre-computed statistics into the application instead. I think some, uh, some uh, loggers actually provide pre-computed statistics and not the raw data. Uh, or you might have just one access. And in either case, it's uh, possible. Um, the application uses a CSV file, that's comma separated value files. These are very easy to generate. For instance, if your data is in Excel, you use the save as uh, dialog and choose CSV. That's about it. All other similar platforms make it just as easy. Okay, I guess it's back to that. So, the next thing you, we want to do is choose statistics. There's, uh, well, these are the, this is the list of statist statistics that we found useful in our analysis. I think we will, add, we will definitely add more to the list uh, as per user re requests or if we see that other statistics are helpful for us. Um, there are some navigation buttons like select all, select none, invert selection that make it easy to choose. The next step is selecting your models. Maybe it's, oh, it's okay here. So these are, this is a list of models that we found in the literature. Um, a lot of them in uh, Ran and All's paper on uh, vouchers some in other papers. Um, again, here we will definitely add more if you request it. Um, it's easily extendable. Um, two slides ago, you chose your statistics, and not all, statistic you choo not all statistics you choose have to end up in the model. We have, a, uh, we have a stage of feature selection where you can select all of the features if you like, or you can perform an F-test and uh, enter into the model only statistics that uh, have a difference between the categories. So it's like doing an ANOVA on each one of the features and just entering significant ones. Uh, a very important step is then to do cross-validation. Um, well, intuitively, you're not interested in fitting the model to a data. So that's what you're doing because you have to. What you're interested in is getting a model that will predict your future data. So the way this is done is you, you take all of your data. You, well, you probably, you probably all know this. You take all your data, you split it somehow. For instance, if you do the train test split, you just split it in half. You, tr you train your model on one of the halves and test on the second half to evaluate the performance. Um, <coughs> another option is to do k-fold cross-validation, in which case you uh, partition your data into k partitions, and then in, in each iteration you uh, train your data on everything except for one and evaluate on the final partition. <coughs> uh, once we've done all of this, we just, I'll show that on the app actually. So I'm gonna show the whole process. We choose a file. This table. Yeah. Oh, I was going to show how we get to that table on there. Yeah, but yeah, but well, since uh, yeah, each row is an observation, okay, and since it's a three-dimensional observation, it's not really sequential, right? It's a sort of uh, mashed up sequential, right? So each each three each three uh, numbers is actually uh, one point, right? One uh, one 3D acceleration point. 
and those are sequential. Is it clear? Yeah, because that's what the, the log uh, logs. It's, uh, oh, I probably should have said that. <laughs> I might not all know this. Uh, the log uh, has um, a, well, you can set it, say, four seconds of uh, measurement, a four second measurement window in which it measures uh, acceleration, say, in 10 hertz per axis. So you have 120 numbers, right? So this row will have 120 numbers, and the last column will be a label. Yeah, so if, uh, I'll stop here and ask if there are any questions before we continue. Okay. Um, why can't I get the file? <laughs> I have it all there, but I want to do it. I want to show, yeah. Okay, downloads. Okay, so I'm just going to click next, 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 basically. Okay. So it, it, it takes it a couple of minutes. It's processed on the server, and it will all be flushed out here in a second. So I'll show you, the, I'll show you how the output starts until it loads. So the, the first thing you get is the first several lines of your data. Uh, the purpose is uh, that uh, you want to know that the server understands you. Right? So <laughs> if, if these are the numbers you see in your file and you see them here, then everything is OK. Otherwise, there's probably a uh, format issue. Still running. Okay. Uh, the next thing is some uh, descriptive statistics. Um, one one thing you you want to see in front of you and keep yeah okay, keep in mind is the distribution of your observations. So here's a table and a plot of uh, the number of observations per category. Uh, this is important because if you have very few observations in some of the categories and many in others, this will definitely affect the performance of the classification. Okay. Um, I'll show that there. We have a button that will allow you to load plots, example plots of your, uh, from different categories. This also might take uh, a few seconds. Really needs a wide screen. Okay, so what we show here is uh, examples from the different <laughs> examples from different classes. This is uh, flapping and this is soaring, for instance. Um, if you haven't done this until this stage, then you probably should see what your data looks like and uh, what the different classes look like. See what differences exist between different categories. If you don't see differences, it doesn't mean that they're not uh, separable, but it's a direction anyway. Probably not separable. So the next tab is, uh, uh, you, you see these tabs up here, right? Okay. The next tab is uh, um, the output of each one of the models that you chose to evaluate. For each model, you get uh, a confusion matrix, both in a table and a tabular and graphical form. Uh, a confusion matrix is uh, a table that describes the performance of uh, a classifier in, in a very specific way. So each row, uh, consider the first row, for instance. The first row considers uh, observations that were classified, that were labeled as active flight or flapping by shy, <laughs> as it were. Um, and, it, uh, and each column will give you the proportion of these observations that were labeled as different, with different labels by the classifier. So 81.8% in this case, if you, if we use the, yeah, this one, I should, uh, I should have said this before. 
Uh, the Uh, at the top, we have all of the different models that we chose to evaluate. The, this one is the nearest neighbor, the nearest neighbor model. So in this case, active flight was was correctly classified in 81.8% of the time. 2.6% of the time was classified as uh, soaring. 0% of the time was sitting, uh, etc. Then we have the same thing in a graph, in a, in a picture. And at the bottom, we have uh, additional measures of performance, uh, recall, precision, and accuracy. These, uh, will, these are detailed in the manual and will be in our paper, but I'll just uh, briefly describe what they are. So the recall of the model with respect to uh, any one of the behaviors, well, it's just the diagonal of the confusion matrix, really. It's the percent of observations <coughs> that were uh, labeled as, say, active flight, that were correctly classified as active flight, so 81.25%. So you can see it's just a diagonal of this thing. The precision with respect to any one of the, of the labels is the percent of the observations that were classified as that category that were correctly classified in that way. Right? So it's the, an element of the diagonal of the confusion matrix divided by the sum of the column. Is this uh, clear? The accuracy uh, is uh, the probability that uh, an observation would be either correctly classified as its uh, true uh, uh, behavior, or correct, or if it's not from that uh, from that uh, category, it will not be classified as of that category. That's just percentage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, times 100. <laughs> yeah. It's just because I added those later. Um, th these values for accuracy are high just because there's many categories. The more categories there are, the higher that will get. It's not, uh, it's not a number you can compare to uh, recall precision. So, uh, on, are not so dependent on the number of categories. Okay, uh, the next tab is a comparison of the of the different models. There's the overall percent correct and standard deviation of the overall percent correct for a model. The standard deviation is computed uh, using the cross-validation procedure that you choose. So if you, ch if you choose a train test split, there'll be no standard deviation because there's only one repetition. Otherwise, you chose the number of repetitions. And that's what it's computed. Okay, so in addition, we have these tables of uh, recall precision and accuracy lumped together for all of the models. Um, this is a good tool for actually choosing the model that uh, interests you at the moment with respect to the behaviors that are important for the research you're do you're do you are doing. Uh, now finally, once you've chosen your model, uh, it's time to use it to annotate new data. The way we're going to do this is uh, just upload a new file, a CSV file with exactly the same format, except now you obviously do not have the final column with the behavioral annotation, because this is data you have no behavioral annotation for. And I'm going to do that on that screen. So label new data. Yeah. And say we like linear SVM, so I choose that one and go. I'll have to wait because I don't have it ready. Well, this is a small file, so it shouldn't take very long. And what we get back is just a uh, column of labels. Yeah. 
So what you would probably do is take this column and copy paste it back into the file you uploaded. Okay. Um, another, another possibility for using this model is to annotate the raw data on a map. Uh, this is, uh, well, this, this can be done only for EOPS data as of now. And again, if anybody else, if anybody has different loggers and would like us to implement this for his data, we will do it. Um, EOPS data looks like that. This is just the raw data you get from the logger, well, once you, uh, you run the decoder. What we have here is, uh, Uh, we have alternating lines of GPS and ACC data. And what we're going to do here is take uh, the GPS row and use it as a position, take the following ACC row and annotate it, and then plot it on the map with the color describing the behavior that it was assigned. So I'm going to just go ahead and do this. And this time I'll choose some other model, say a random forest. Before I do this, there is one small issue of calibration. And I have uh, calibrate using EOB's default values uh, checked. Um, for those of you not familiar with this, um, the, the loggers give you, well, the acceleration loggers give you a raw value that's uh, well, in millivolts or something like that, uh, because that's what they measure. And this has to be converted into acceleration units. Um, this is, it's done with a simple uh, linear model, but you have, to, you have to fit this model. We call it uh, a calibration. You get, default, you get default values for this model from the manufacturer. And this is what I'm going to use here. Uh, since this is just a visualization tool, and I don't, it doesn't really, the details don't matter that much. For, right now. They obviously do for actual research. But, uh, the alternative is to do the calibration for each device. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, so an alternative would be to do the, the calibration yourself and not check that box. Or in the future, we might uh, allow to enter the the parameters. Okay, so this is uh, this takes a few seconds, and here we get the same plot again. So I think it's probably easy to see it here. It's what I showed in one of the first slides. So it's <laughs> there's not much more to say about this. Um, one extra feature is uh, the ability to download um, the. Another function is the ability to download the feature files that were computed by the application. These are the features you selected originally. You can just click download feature file. There's also a normalized version. That is, in the normalized version, each column has zero mean and uh, one standard deviation. Okay, so this is downloading. And what you get is just uh, each row instead of raw data is the features that were computed. Wait for it to download. Yeah. So in this file, there, this is the only file that I'm showing that, has, that actually has uh, a header row, because you might not remember <laughs> which statistics you chose. So here it is important. Uh, OK. Um, any questions so far? So yeah. If I understand correctly, Uh, it depends on the mo it depends on the model. Some of them are stochastic. Some of them you would expect the same exact results for. And the splitting when you have your test. Oh yeah, yeah. I wasn't thinking of that. You're you're right. You'll get slightly different results. But usually qualitatively, it's the same. 
Uh, yeah, so if you use a large number of splits, then you expect it to be almost exactly the same, right? Um, otherwise, it's not guaranteed. That it's, this is like saying that you'll have a large standard deviation of the percent correct over the splits. Sometimes that's the case. Yes. Uh, no. Okay, so the question was, is there a time scale issue? So what is the time scale that you are computing the behavior over? And uh, the answer is no, at least in general, since you, you well, you chose that when you set the, the logger to, uh, to have a certain window, right? So if your measurements are three, four, five seconds, that's your time scale. Yeah, you do. You obviously do. Right. Not here. Um, the, well, the idea of using uh, some time series properties for, for annotation of behavior is out there, right? Um, we're not doing it. One reason is that we usually have rather sparse uh, measurements. So if you have uh, a measurement every 10 minutes or so, you might lose some of it. Well, it depends how fast your autocorrelation fades, right? So it's still is probably useful, but we're not doing it. That's the, that's the real answer. <laughs> Maybe uh, yeah. you just uh, uh, have a question about the length of the vows of the, of the acceleration. Um, the rule of thumb is to select the length that, that uh, um, is in the duration of a cyclical behavior. So if your behavior is, uh, um, or, or, or the signature of the behavior is in, in 10 seconds, so you, this is what you, you select. For example, for flopping, you need to, to take uh, several flops, okay? Three or, or, or four flops, so you get a good signature of this, of this thing. And uh, we found out that in many birds, it's around four seconds. Uh, maybe in mammals, it could be different, but you need to know your animal and the, <laughs> the behavior that you study. And then, and then select the, the, the bulk line. Yeah, so I just want to say about what uh, Neil, Neil said, you can take this and then apply some, uh, some model as an actual layer uh, that will take into account uh, correlation, well, behaviors being continuous in time is more, I would say. Uh, it's true. 
this, this does not do that, you can do that. Uh, talk a bit about future directions. So one thing that uh, was pointed out to me is that I'm showing very few plots of uh, observations. So I, I, we might add a feature that will allow to just download a zip file with uh, the plots for all of your training data. Um, a run, run with default button, instead of just doing next, 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 would be useful. And uh, possibly some collaboration, collaboration with MoveBank that will allow integration with data in MoveBank. OK, and this is, I'm sorry about cutting half your face off. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, so. Yes. Right. Um, yes. So the question is, I'm giving uh, deterministic labeling. Why not? probabilistic labeling. And this sort of classifier, well, is hard to, uh, to think of in uh, probabilistic terms, most of them, some of them, some of them, yeah, okay. Um, as a unified framework, instead of saying, if you use these classifiers, you'll get uh, just labeling, if you use these, you'll get the distribution. Uh, to, to make it simple, is the real answer, it's all the same, but uh, yeah. But it's possible. It's possible. And maybe it should be added to, uh, yeah, what happens? Okay, I, I will not go back to the slide, but maybe it should be added to future directions, yeah. 